<laughs> it would be a wolf, but eh? Hello, 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 and happy new year, everyone. Oh, it's good to be back for, well, the second time in about four days to talk about another Wolves game. We're going to be talking about Wolves versus Man United, of course, and also previewing uh, the Villa game happening midweek. Joining me today, we've got Jaffo and Matt. Boys, how are we? Matt, did you have a good New Year's? I did. I've just come back from what is the wife's family's tradition of having a Christmas-sized dinner on New Year's and had it about two hours ago. So after some pints in the daytime as well, um, I'm going to need your enthusiasm just to keep me awake, I think. That's fine. I'm going to bring the energy today. Um, Despite being up at, quite frankly, the crack of dawn, I'm past the point of tiredness now. So I'm just in a delirious state. So... I might be mm-hmm. a bit silly this show. Um, Jafo, did you get too much for New Year's or did you have a quiet Nah, one? very quiet, yeah, as usual. Don't do a lot. So I just just, just had a few drinks, relaxed, and then, uh, you know, uh, business as usual today. Just thinking about what happened yesterday with the game and and hopefully things will be uh, changing a little bit going forward, but we'll see. Yeah, let's, um, let, let's get right into the meat of it because... It wasn't the ending of the year we were hoping for. You could describe the, the game against Man United as, as a free hit. I don't personally like using that phrase uh, myself. Um, but there were some positives with him there. As always, we do like to talk about the starting lineup. There, there was only really one change um, within it, which was Nunes making his first start under Lopetegui. And most notably, him kind of playing in his actual position, it very much feeling like he was playing in that slightly deeper role with Martino ahead of him. Um, and the front three continuing to be playing Costa and Podence. When the team news was announced, uh, Jafo, I think the only other sticking point that was questioned pre-game was whether we should start with the back five. Were you happy with the overall lineup? Yeah, I, I think... Um... Bringing in Nunes for Hodge was was a sensible decision. I think he just got a little bit more physicality. Nunes has and has that ability to drive with the ball a lot better than than Hodge. And I think that sort of experience comes in as well. I spent especially against some very good players, you know, Eric, Ericsson and um, who eventually came on Fred and, and people like this. They're very good footballers and, and who can control games. And Hodge probably did, doesn't have that experience in his Arsenal yet to to really command a game like that and put his, his stamp on his uh, stamp on a game. Uh, I mean, talking about the back five, I, I probably wouldn't have gone with it personally. Um, although Totti came in and did very well against Everton and, and it kind of, that's sure enough of the game allowed us to, to, to win not on the, on the break. Uh, I think trying to absorb pressure like that for a full 90 minutes would have been suicide um, against Man United. And I think, We'd have probably lost the game by a lot more. Matt, what were your thoughts on the front three? Because, I mean, let, let's be honest, we, we're not scoring goals whatsoever anyway. So you could argue it doesn't really matter who's up front. Mm. But would you have been keen to see a Jimenez start instead of Costa? Or is it much of a muchness? I think when you know you've got a player that's on the fringe of a move, as reported, it's always difficult to want to put them in your eleven because you know what is that player's head in the in the right space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, with a player like Podence, who tries to be as physical as he can be, no one can deny him that tries to be physical, but just doesn't have the physical attributes that kind of Huang does. Um, I, I think having Costa on at least allows you something of a physical threat. But you know he was a bit tame yesterday, wasn't he? Let's be let's be brutally honest. Um, front three, 
much in the same way that United started without a recognised striker, goals were never going to come for us from that front three or at least a focal point striker. They're always going to come from someone creatively if we were going to score, as has Nevers become our top scorer so far this season. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's almost that goals have to be shared amongst the team and the front three are just not passengers along for helping everybody score. But, you know, without that recognised striker, that front three doesn't really concern me that much. It's more what Lopetegui does at the 65th, 70th minute that I think is really important to us. And to answer the question you asked, Jafo, I think that's the reason why I think it was a benefit not going to five at the back or three at the back. Because actually, if if a team is, you know, it's nil-nil and you want to invite pressure onto them to be able to counter them, you can't do that at minute one. You've got to do it later on in the game when there's pressure like Everton who are being booed off the pitch. And, you know, we end up getting the winner. So I think four at the back was the right call as well. Yeah, I think it would be quite tricky to kind of go from five at the back to then, you say, get to the 65th minute and go from a five to a four. I know, I think it's probably easier to say, take the step back than it is to progress further forward um, with the number of players, I guess. And you mentioned in terms of how Lopetegui is getting them playing. And I thought, especially for that first 20 minutes, that was the most intense I've seen a Wolves team play for a long time in terms of how high we're pushing up the pitch and where we're winning the balls back. It, I, I think despite his age, having Matinho that slightly bit further forward and his nous and his brain, um, for want of a better term, he's a good tackler and he was able to pick the pocket a lot of time. And I thought that high press seemed to really get under United's skin for that first 20 minutes. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing about it was, from where I was sat in my um, Billy Wright upper seat doing, uh, doing AD stuff, it wasn't even enough for Lopetegui. He wanted more. He, he mm. was he, I'm so animated and he was yeah. pushing them forward, pushing them forward. And, you know, having Matino that, that extra few yards forward gives those, I say weary bones. I think he's like one year older than me. Uh, like he gives, <laughs> like, but he, it gives him the opportunity to like, you know, he, he's not having to take 10, 15 sh- sh- strides to then try and press to win. He's that like little bit closer to the action to be able to do that. And he's still got the, the, you know the the intelligence and the and the nous that only a veteran has to be able to do it. So, you know, it, it's great that we, we've been Lopetegui has been able to find the preference. I don't know if that's intelligence on his part or negligence on Bruno's part, but it's in a short space of time you're seeing some fruition without the recruitment coming in yet. So hopefully it's a good sign to come. Yeah, I think so, and I think you're right what you say about Matinho and 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 having sort of that nous. I think that utilizes him in the in the best way. I think when we've seen him, seen him play a little bit deeper, I think like you say, because he's getting a bit weary with his tired legs, he can't do the yards, and it, it just becomes less effective. So utilizing everything that every ounce of experience that's got he's got in his whole brain and throughout he's got throughout his playing career, in order to have an impact on a game, is the most important thing for him now and. You know, we're getting at that point where we've been saying it for the last two seasons, but it'll probably keep going on. That he's at the point where okay, should he be maybe playing as many games as he is, and 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 finding a, a clever way to utilize a player like this, like Lopetegui's done with um, Sil, um, J- J- Jesus Navas, hmm. who was at City when he had him at Sevilla, and he's prolonged his career and and has probably actually seen probably the best spells of his career. Um, playing it right back, maybe that's something he can do with some of the older players here and, and try and reinvigorate them and reinvent them to get the best out of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see how it kind of plays out with Matinho and to, in terms of him playing that. You know, he's not like an attacking midfielder, but just playing that little bit further forward, it places some of his strengths. You know, I guess there's kind of almost a quite interesting arc because he almost played as a little bit more progressive in his early days um, when he was a lot younger. I saw a clip on um, on Twitter of him scoring a lovely goal. I think 
it might have been when he was at Porto. I can't quite remember now. But, you know, it was in like 2006. And all of a sudden, like, you, you kind of, you know, he's someone who's almost kind of dipped up and down in terms of where he plays on the pitch. So, you know, this might be quite a nice Indian summer for him um, if they think he's going to be able to just rein everyone in a bit, in that little bit further forwards. Um, but I say, they were pressing really well and making Man United think a lot more than I thought they would. You mentioned Lopetegui, Matt, and um, how demanding he was. And there's two things we need to cover. A, uh, as I put on Twitter, his sheer disregard for a technical area. He, <laughs> the, the, there are no lines that can stop that man. The, the, I think there's a point in the... Uh, I think it must have been in the second half where like, the Man United player was trying to take a throw in just next to him and he was just on his back. I was like, is no one going to pull him aside or anything just to rein him in? Um, which, look, I know we can buy into like a manager's outlook and personality, but it's a, it gets that, that passion does get fans on the side pretty early on, doesn't it? It does. And, you know, you can't ask for desire and passion and a running through a brick wall mentality without showing that yourself on on the touchlines. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? You have to show that you've got the energy to lead this this team into let's not beat around the bush of relegation scrap. So it's good to see that. It's good to see that he um, is engaging in you know, saying all the right things as well, as you expect a seasoned manager to say, but it's just a breath of fresh air, really. I think what a lot of fans have been worried about now for the longest time is we just need someone that looks and sounds and shows that they know what they're doing. You know, week in, week out, tactically making subs at the right times, not being afraid to make subs and making changes and 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 calling people out when when they need to be. You know, credit where credit's due to Ten Hag for the Rashford side of things. You know, and he mm. seems like he's got um, he's he's ducks in a row there. And I like I you know liked what he said about saying that you know it's a team effort. Everybody has to adhere to the same standards. There's no you know there's no one person that's better than the rest of this team. And you know, it's proved dividends for them in the end. Um, but you know, it's good to see that Lopetegui has an identity already something that fans can get on board with because you know it goes both ways doesn't it you know the, the crowd has for like it or not it, it has been the atmosphere has been poor inside of Molyneux for a long time now and who can blame the atmosphere being poor with some of the dross that we've been served over the last well 18 months now mm. um but it you know first it giveth then it taketh away if you're getting the you know if, if you put in out these performances it comes to no surprise, so I'm hoping that Lopetegui's behaviour on the sidelines can inspire the you know the crowd as well. I was going to say, and and what's more inspiring is his sartorial elegance of going for the um, complimenting um, turtleneck, brown turtleneck, brown shoes <laughs> combo. Well, that is something. It's accented I'm, perfectly, isn't it? I mean, it's it's a power play, is what it is. Like. <laughs> Just like in my head, though, I mean, a manager, you have a shirt and tie or your trackies and your official sports where this feels like the first manager we've had in who's like just just wearing I say, what he wants, just what well, he thinks looks good it, if he's going down, you know, um, Brindley Place or wherever. Well, it's one of these, you know. People, time is money, and if he needs to just quickly jump on the first train to New Street and get it down to <laughs> B at one, it's just what we've got to do. You know, he's no time ready. for a costume change. Yeah, um, we should probably talk about the game, shouldn't we? Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd rather talk about this. I did think first half, in particular, we 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 did play well and did ask those questions of them, but I think we're but play who I guess stood out the most for Wolves throughout the entire game was Nunes playing in, again almost that slightly deeper role where you, you, we've seen Matinho play and it's where he has predominantly played throughout his whole career 
and Jafar, he, he seemed to very much thrive, as you'd expect. Um, yeah. get, you know, getting those balls in those tighter areas, but as soon as he actually managed to turn and go, just the pitch would open up for him. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think he got to probably, I think I noticed it was about the 70th minute. It was the first time that he gave the ball away. Hmm. Just when when he receives the ball into feet, like you say, he he turns and he moves and it just seems to open up because he, he just doesn't, you know, it's, it seems simple, but he doesn't give the ball away. No. And, and, and and when you're in a game like that, again, when you're, and, and that's the way we're going to be playing is we're going to be not being able to control possession it, for the most part of most of the games that we play, especially against teams like Man United, you want players like him who are going to be able to make the most of the time that you've got in possession. And and that's what he did yesterday. And a lot of the times he's driving with the football, he's creating space for the people around him. And that sort of like chaos when he pushes through and you've got the overload of him and Moutinho in these advanced areas, the, the wingers and the strikers can sort of come into play then. And I think that's what we'll see more when you start to see um, Matos Cunha come into the side as well. And you've got more players, hopefully, when they look at further recruitment, is is that they use, use these players together to create the formula. And I think that's what he's, he's trying to do already. I think that's what we've seen for them the first three games is, is this team is evolving at a, quite a rapid rate now in the way that we play football. And it's evolving to what I think we all probably agree is probably a better style of football for one. And two, I think it's probably more likely the most effective way that we're going to stay in this league. Yeah. Um, I think my sort of thing is, I sort of get the impression with Nunes, this very little he can't do with a football. And that's, I guess, a very blitheringly obvious statement, but he's a clearly very talented individual with football. And for me, you just want to get him on the ball as much as possible in places that he's going to exploit the best of his talents. And the fact that he can get the ball deep, but he is so bloody progressive with it, Matt, isn't he? But he isn't someone who, Mm. you know, he's not a water, you know, he's not a captain sideways, is he? No, I think what what is um, testament to that is the fact that Casemiro and um, Fred literally had to hack us as a team and Nunes down literally to stop attacks. You know, Casemiro <laughs> was. It, it, I mean, I loved. I this should be sacrilege as it's the opposition, but I loved the way that Casemiro played yesterday. It's just yes. if I was a footballer, that's exactly how I'd play. You know, he was just <laughs> like. You just know when you've got to give that yellow away. He's clever with the way he, you know, he was getting himself about the pitch, using himself as a block, etc. Um, but he had to because of the way that Nunes would carry the ball, and it allows because you, you know to, to counter that, you've got to put one, two men on him at least, opening space for everybody else, and he gets that pass out wide. I've never known us, or I've never known the game in general, where the the the, the wide players had so much time with the ball, mm. like. I, I don't know if they didn't know Bueno existed, but he just had the absolute freedom of that left-hand side for the first half. He just had acres yeah. of space in front of him, the green, green grass of Molyneux to to, to, to go ahead of him. So if having someone in the middle like that caused so much problems to allow us then to, to play on, you know, it, it, it's been said time and time again how much he's going to be utilising full-backs or, 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 you know, or wing-backs if we're in, if we're in a five that, that way. Having Nunes there and Neves there as well can only strengthen. And now that we're seeing the, the the benefits of that system coming through, I think as we adapt and as we bring in players that can adapt more to this system, I think it will get better and better. Yeah, it's definitely it definitely seems to be getting there. Um, we did create a few chances, first half and second half. Um, but I guess the main focus is the defence because Man United did apply constant pressure throughout the game. And there's no there's no turning away from it. Um, but one player who has come under a lot of criticism this season it, it is Collins at the back. I thought bar the goal, which admittedly is a fairly important part for a defender, he had a he had a solid uh, game. What what did you think, Jafari? Are you a 
where do you sort of stand on Collins at the moment? I think, yeah, I think like you say, he's probably he's made some high profile mistakes in some of the recent games and, and, and he's someone who, who hasn't really justified his price tag this season. But I don't think that could, you can really say a lot about that because a lot of the players aren't really playing up to their, their sort of standard and their ability. Um, but I think against Man United, I think, yeah, I think he played well. It, we saw what we wanted to see from him and Kilman is a player, centre-backs who are going to pick the ball up and and, and carry and, and and press the team up, the, the pitch a little bit more. So our average position, I, I, so I probably haven't got a map, but I think if you look at it, compare it to some of the previous games, it's probably some of the last few games before the World Cup break, is is the average position of those centre-backs is going to be a lot further forward. And I think that's exactly why we, we bought them. And I think it's exactly why we bought Collins. And I say it, bar the goal. And I don't think that's even really his fault. Yeah. I, I can't really put any blame on him, really. Uh, for that, but other than that, I thought he had a really good game. I think he was a solid seven out of ten, really. Yeah, uh, I was going to say uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about talk about the goal because I've watched it back a few times now, and I still can't quite work out: is it just a good goal from Man United slash Rashford? Are Wolves a bit at fault? I can't, you know, is there a blame game to be had, Matt? Um, mm. It's a tough one. I mean, you know, roll that dice again. And if, if Johnny managed to get a block in it, he gave away a penalty. I'm amazed he didn't. I'm amazed Rashford didn't go down anyway with arms interlocking as much as he did mm. um, with Johnny. I think it's one of those where a, a lapse in concentration, the ball is zigzagging around. And actually, on the balance of play and some of the chances United had, I mean, if Rashford was on, that silly back pass from Samado would have been punished. If yeah. it hadn't happened, then I think it's it, it's one of those where I think on the balance of play we didn't put away our chances, and Man United put away one. I don't know if you know the the Semedo yellow is as damning as the goal was, if that makes sense, because Semedo couldn't play in the same way and was you know kind of hooked off at risk of his lack of discipline, you could say, over the last few months. Um, and then when Johnny came on, listen, he, you know, he's been a proud servant to the club. I don't think there's many that are getting Johnny on the back of their shirts these days. I think the public perception of him isn't fantastic anymore. And it's it's a bit sad to see, really. Um, but I think that substitution changed things for us, unfortunately. And once we were 1-0 down, the game plan, and, um, and Lopetegui said as much, kind of went out the window um i think we looked pretty awful after we conceded and in lieu of a an unlucky handball from rashford it should have probably been two um so in terms of is there anyone to blame you know probably between johnny and collins yes but it, it's one of those i think it was coming if i'm brutally honest yeah i think that's how i've kind of settled on it myself it's you could always want them to do better but I think that the likelihood, if either Johnny or Collins had acted earlier, they'd given away a penalty, um, mm. unfortunately. And you're right, yeah, Man United did create chances throughout that game. You know, they had one clawed off the line um, as well in the first half as well. And I lauded Lopetegui for his substitutes and how proactive he was against Everton. And he made changes early on again yesterday. You know, he... He pulls off Costa at half time for Adam, which initially did give us a bit of spark, but we did seem to. Uh, I've been critical of Diego Costa for Wolves, and frankly, still am. He had a he had a chance in the first half as well, that you know it was like his leg had lost all sense of power to mm. be able to navigate it towards the goal. But at least he kind of still gives you that person in the middle, um, which when he was off, the game plan, you're right, it did start to fall apart. And, you know, almost f from there on in, the, yeah. you know, Johnny comes on in the 65th and we just lose that bit of forward momentum that Samedo gives you. And, you know, Johnny, 
again, love him. Great servant. Looks like he's running in treacle now. Mm. And whether that's he a does. fitness issue, it's sad to it, say. yeah, and it's it, it, it's really tricky um, to you know resonate that with yourself, isn't it? Because he's been around for so long, he's gone through so much, and you can never question his due diligence playing for Wolves. But it feels like when you compare it to you know basically all the other fullbacks, and Samedo's got his flaws. Don't get me wrong, but when you look at you know, the youthful Bueno on the other side, just galloping up and down the wing. You know, it, it it's like having a cart horse next to, you know, um, Red Room or whatever. But, yeah, the subs, it, it did kind of, the, the game plan seemed to go out the window and Lopetegui was trying to get something to stick and it just didn't quite fall into place in the end. Um and again, he tried to go for five of the back for the last 20 minutes again. Um, Jafo, do you think that's something we're going to see quite regularly from him at the moment? Or do you think it'll be just until they've sorted out, I guess, a bit more for defensive structure? Because I feel like teams are going to start to notice because, you know, two becomes a pattern if you're not careful. Mm-hmm. I think so. I think... I think it's one of those things is 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 how we control a game later into the game. And I think I think he's alluded to it and a lot of what he said uh in interviews and what's come out via lines from the club about the, the players actually not being fit enough. Yeah. I think a lot of that is down to fitness. And I think after a few more games we'll probably see it happening less and less because that control of the game and and and, and how they influence the game by taking a bit more defensive control into it. I think that would be less needed once we've got the fitness up and the and the intelligence, the football intelligence is, is starting to build and, and and they can go through 90 minutes without needing to make changes or, you know, we're not seeing mistakes in the last sort of 20 minutes like we have seen under Lage. Um And I think alluding to, to uh, how, what we've seen, I think that will probably, like I say, sort of, work itself out. I think we'll probably definitely see it against Villa again. I think mm. that, that that's that's likely. But looking at Man City, Liverpool, these are the games where we, we might start with that formation. Possibly. Um, but I, I, when we start getting to the end of the month and end of January, I think we'll see that transition a lot less. And it'll only be if we need to during a game for a tactical reason. Um but for I think at the moment it's a fitness thing, and I don't think it's going to be long term as a solution. Yeah, that that that's sort of what I'm hoping for, to be honest. Because I think it will invite more teams to you know will invite pressure on us if we're not careful for more teams, especially if they kind of know it's going to happen if we're not careful. With any of standout players here, we've mentioned Nunes. Um, another player I thought had a really solid game was um, Jose Sarr, which, you know, who's fantastic for us for the majority of last season. Seems to not be his usual self in a way, in terms of being so, uh, I guess, outspoken, being this big personality, Matt. But again, mm. he delivered a, a, a lot yesterday at times where, you know, I've seen. It go for your way for us. Yeah, I think he's only been disappointing when we've attributed it to his his own immaculately high standards. You know, I think when you've had some of the calamitous defending that we've had over the last, say, five games prior to Lopetegui coming in, and even Nelson Samado's best efforts for us to concede yesterday. Um I think you know there's so many there's only so many times you can pull the rabbit out of a hat. Do you know what I mean? I think actually, do, are there many goals that we see him concede where we say he should have done better? Like I don't, re- I, I feel like there isn't that many. I just mm. think that actually yesterday he was coming out with these spectacular saves time and time again, and maybe he's like more of a confidence player that we than we realise. And under under um, under Lopetegui, you know, Nunes came out with a less than subtle. Um, interview stating about the previous management compared to this management and you know may, you know he must be more of a confidence player than we realize because he seemed more um 
I don't, I don't know how to describe him, but he he just felt he was he was off his line that half a yard quicker, yeah, um, than before, and he was a not saying he wasn't willing to put his body on the line before because he clearly mm. was, but he just seemed that li- that had that little bit more spark than we had seen of him prior to the World Cup. Yeah, I think that's what I was sort of thinking, especially for the um, Samedo blunder, where he was just again he just pinched the ball. Whereas, I say maybe six weeks, eight weeks ago, he's having to dive to get that ball, mm. and he's just a bit more on it. And again, it, it, it's nothing big, and he's not exactly someone who's cost us games in the way other players have. But I don't know. Well, think, think of it like think think of him going away with with the Portuguese squad and getting a break from Wolves. Think of, you know, the second that, that 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 Jimenez is out of the care of Dr. Death and then he's miraculously healed of his chronic fatigue and it was this, you know. I think a lot of these players have just enjoyed time away from what has been a, a, a real um, cesspit of an atmosphere around the club uh, and then Lopetegui's come in and changed things. So I think hopefully that will resonate as, as time goes on. Um, and I think that other players are seeing the benefit of this change of regime as well. I mean, Bueno, like I'd mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, he, you know, I don't think anyone really can look at him and, and uh, doesn't see him now as deserving to be in that 11. Whereas mm. six months ago, people wouldn't have given, you know, and right, you know, rightly so, logically so, wouldn't have really given him the time of day to play. Do you know what I mean? Wouldn't have. He wouldn't have had the chance to, to prove himself. So it's positive. I'm really trying to be positive. <laughs> um, and I think that Lopetegui has a big part to play in that in creating a culture of belief. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think there's, there's every reason to be positive. And at the end of the day, these footballers, they're just human beings. And like you say, it was a toxic atmosphere before Yulen came in. Um, and, and say, having this World Cup break, he's probably done the world a good. So they can have a refresh. They can come back with their minds fresh and 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 say, okay, okay, we're ready to go now. And you see, like you say about Jose Sar, when as a footballer, his whole abilities and his qualities are in his personality. And we've seen his person in that shine through in the last couple of games. We've seen Jose mm. Sar reappear on the football pitch. It's like he's been playing with a cloud around his head for the past couple of months. And we've not really seen who he is as a person and that, that bubbly nature and that energy on the pitch. And I think we've seen that with a few, a few of the footballers. And I think yeah. Neves probably suffered with it a little bit at the World Cup as well. We didn't really see that commanding presence of someone who wanted to to smash 40-yard balls wide and, and, and try and control the game. And I think that's what we're starting to see is, is that atmosphere starting to turn and we yeah. see some good stuff coming. And I think, it, it, again, it, it loops back to what we're saying about atmosphere in the grounds as well. And it's players who, who exemplify that that will get the fans going as well. And one of the biggest issues around Wolves is the, I was going to say, the lack of leaders and the lack of those big personalities. And one of the things in the summer where we had, you know, players like, Matinho, Ruddy, Sace, all going out of contract, who were all, you know, big personalities in the dressing room. You had Cody as well. So, you know, losing Sace and Ruddy, who very clearly both on the pitch and off the pitch had a big presence about them. Obviously, you can say the same about Cody. And, okay, you could argue footballing ability for replacements who come in are on par, but that, I guess that cultural, psychological you know, big locker room guys as they call it in America players do need to step up and especially if you're playing crap you might become a bit more withdrawn and in fact it feels like Lopetegui's come in and you know, blank slate demanded that bit of extra passion from the big players and we know Sars got that and it almost feels like it's stemming out from the back so, if Sars confident and Sars feeling it, he's going to make Collins and Kilman more reassured. If he does that, then does that mean Neves gets to push that little bit further forward? 
and not have to be on their toes as much. And hopefully it kind of progresses a little bit further and fingers crossed, score some goals, um, mm. which hopefully we'll do against Villa, um, which is going to be my lovely segue into a break, guys, because we're going to take 45 seconds off to hear about our sponsors from the always wonderful Pixel Yeti Media, um, of which afterwards we're going to talk about Villa and talk about toasters as well. We'll see you in just a second. Hi all, Gully from Wolves Fancast here, and just like all of you long-suffering Wolves fans, I know exactly what it feels like to be lacking a creative spark here, some outside-of-the-box thinking there, but our sponsors Pixel Yeti Media are here to help. They're a creative agency that cover all of your web design, branding and marketing needs, with our very own WolvesFanCast.com, a fine example of their work. So much so that I hear Jeff Shee is looking to do a deal this summer. For now, it's back to the team to ask just where the Diogo Jota money is gone. We may have just had our answer. Hello, welcome back everybody. The games are coming thick and fast. Um, It feels like we're not getting a moment to breathe at the moment um, with the amount of fixtures that we've had post World Cup because we're back playing on Wednesday. Um, To give anyone an indication, we're currently doing this on Sunday. I'm only saying this because I've kind of lost all comprehension of days of the week in the last three weeks of my life. Um, But yeah, we're playing Wednesday, 8pm kickoff. How are you both feeling about it? Um, To give you, I was going to say, a bit of an idea, Villa up to 12th now. Um, having won earlier today against Spurs, really good result for them, rather frustratingly. Um, Jafo, what are your sort of thoughts on Villa at the moment? Because in my head, there's a lot of parallels between Wolves and Villa in terms of them getting rid of a manager and you know basically bringing in a Spanish manager with a good pedigree. Um, so in my head, we are sort of fairly even, but the record's not really shown that at the moment. I mean, yeah, I mean, there is, there's some parallels. I think Emery probably had an easier job going into Villa than, um, uh, yes. than Lopetegui has coming into Wolves. I think that's, I mean, looking at the table, is it evident to say that? But I think just within the culture change that, that there was, I think the way Gerard played football and, and the, the atmosphere that Gerard had, despite some of his uh, indiscretions with people, some of his players, I think that sort of, dressing room probably would have been a little bit more akin to what Emery would have liked and, and made it a little bit easier for him moving forward. Um, but yeah, they've got, they've got a lot of, a lot of players out over there who, who have underperformed this season. Um, some who've, who've done well, but the problem is that they could score goals and we can't. And, and, and that's been the major, major difference between the two of us this season. Uh, whether that being that Danny Ings and, and Watkins are, are better <laughs> better forwards than Jimenez and Costa, I don't really know. But um, it's, it seems that their, their breathing room from the bottom three is allowing them to be a little bit more ex- expressive and, and control games a little bit more against teams like Tottenham, like you saw today. And I think yeah. that's the, 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 the luckiness of the position that they're in because they're not in, in a relegation scrap essentially, or even though we are still close, being in the bottom three and having it looming over your shoulder uh, is a, a lot more tough on the players and the squad in, in, in order to, to pick up and, and uh, be as expressive as you want to be. Yes, I, I, can, I agree. And I think you know, definitely around the, the, the goal score is in there. And, you know, don't get me wrong, Ings and um, Ollie Watkins can be a bit hot and cold, but I, I'd, I'd back them to score more than Jimenez and Costa at the moment. Matt, how are you feeling going into this? I say, sort of, uh, Villa aren't doing awful um, at the moment, and they're not. You no, know, they're not. You know, it, it pains me to say it, to be honest. I, yeah, I don't. I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I don't like it either. I I did watch the Spurs uh, game earlier today, and 
I didn't think Villa looked fantastic. I thought Spurs looked really bad. I think there was a lot of huff and puff from Spurs, but they got tore apart by some, you know, it wasn't groundbreaking stuff that Villa were doing, but they just took they just took their chances well. Um, something mm. that, you know, defensively they were pretty sound, but, you know, I didn't think they were spectacular. And I think if you was to take, I think if we're being realistic and we look at these squads on paper, I think Villa, they've spent, but they've spent relatively well. They've got a good squad and I think they will be disappointed as Villa fans where they are in the table. And I think that obviously so with Wolves as well. But I, 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 the parallels are absolutely right in terms of the situations between their managers and the kind of steadying the ship to be brought in, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, they picked up a couple of injuries today as well. Um, and I do feel that if we have to play them at any point, I think it's better that we play them as we're starting to have a turn of fortune and they are starting to feel potentially comfortable or hopefully complacent because there is that gap between, I think, 13th down is looking like your trapdoor at the moment. Anything above, anything Villa and above looks on paper safe, I think, at the minute. Um, yeah. And it's kind of, you know, that hopefully plays into our hands from a complacency point of view. I'm going into the game, not I wouldn't say quietly confident. I think the big, the big game of the next three is West Ham. You know, if we can get a draw against these and beat West Ham, you will lose to City. That four-point haul, I think, would go a long, long way. I don't think there's anything that we should like massively fear from Aston Villa. I just feel that we need to step up again. You know, we can't stay still with our performances. Like, they has to consistently improve. And I think that that's what will be key now is because now Cunha can come in. It'd be so interesting to see how he plays and what style change we have to do to adapt to him. And, you know, that will be an unknown entity for Villa as well. So if we can make that click straight away, it can only be a positive. Yeah, I mean, do, I was going to say, with um, Cunha, do you guys see him potentially starting tomorrow? I think before the Man United game, I, I probably would have said no. But I think after what we saw when Costa went off and, and the way that we've sort of become reliant on him to actually create chances and make space. And I think what we've seen that Huang and, and Jimenez haven't been able to do in holding the ball up and create these transitions. I, th I changed my mind very quickly after the end of the game. And I think I probably would start him if he's fit and he's ready to go. It's best to get him in as soon as possible because we need to create these relationships between players and, and that's going to be the only way that we're going to be able to score goals and, and get the results to stay up. And I think I think wasting games and important games where we can pick up points to almost stick with the status quo is dangerous in the position that we're in. We haven't got the time to be able to afford to do that. Um, and I think blooding him in into the Premier League and getting him ready in, in, in even a game like that is going to be important. How about you, Matt? Would you um, would you throw him into the, of the deep end, so to speak? It's tough because um, even though this is very much a derby out of necessity than a derby out of hatred, we've kind of had to create this animosity because we've not played our respective proper rivals consistently for so long. Um, I don't know if playing him against Villa, yeah, he could become a hero overnight in the same way that he could become, well, not the villain, don't want to use that pun. But, um, you know, a poor performance straight away against what is a rival can, you know, I don't know. I think I'd be I think I'd be looking to maybe start Costa, see if we're getting any look. And then if we have to make that halftime 60 minute change, bring him on, see how he changes the game. But, you know, he he will be our starter going forward. So I'm really keen to see what system change we put in place to you know to optimize to his strengths from what i see i don't know if he's going to be that focal striker that everything comes through him you know it's so the irony is against united if kalizic was on the end of some of the balls that we were crossing in we could have been like two or three up yeah um and i don't think he's he's not obviously not that kind of player 
so it's going to be really interesting to see how we play around him and 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 meet his or tailor our play to suit him. Uh, on on the side of bring him on after sixty minutes, hmm. um, despite the fact that you know I, I don't rate Costa or Jimenez all that much, um, I think he definitely needs to definitely needs to get games uh, and, and get started early. And you could argue the fact that we've got an FA Cup tie week after as well plays into our hands quite nicely um, in terms of again not necessarily being the highest of stakes for us in, in the present moment, unfortunately, even though I always am up for the cup. Would there be any other changes you'd make? I mean, yes, the games are coming thick and fast, um, but do you, say, do you keep the likes of Wang and Podence? Do you look at bringing Guedes in, who looked sharp before the World Cup, but hasn't really had a Hasn't really had a look since his return. I think the two mm. I'd probably look at would probably be Adama getting some games time from the off. And I think yeah. Bueno is, is, is a concern now because we've got so many games in such a short period of time. He's been being a young lad. I don't want him to burn out. So I think there's, he's got to start looking at a rotation there with Ait Nuri and, and Ait Nuri maybe start against Villa and then bring Bueno in for the next game and, and, and almost not do one for one, but... I knew yeah. probably to get his chance now um, to give Bueno that rest because I say there's always a chance, especially with, with young players who haven't played a lot of senior games, that they will burn out if they play too many in a such a short period. Yeah, no, I, I agree mm. with that. And to be fair, I think Aiden always not looked bad when he's come on. Obviously, he got the winner against Everton, but there's, there's obviously been talk about him moving away. Um, and as you kind of alluded to, Matt, with you know, the, the ongoing Jimenez saga, it would be quite easy for Aiden Nori to throw his toys out of the pram. But he, d- d- from my opinion, anyway, he's, he's definitely not doing that. So I, I'd, I'd be, I wouldn't be upset or disappointed if Bueno didn't start. Um, I think that's a no. fair way to say it. I think uh, a controversial statement alert here. I think we should do a Jurgen Klopp against Liverpool in the cup and not even put out your Guedes's and your Traore's. I think like you put the under 13s out and give <laughs> this squad like a proper, give them some recovery time. Do you know what I mean? I like I, the FA, you know, if, if for some bizarre reason we beat Liverpool and we ended up in the semi-final of the league cup and all of these games in a relegation scrap, and we ended up on a two, a, a, a two domestic cup runs and all of these games. You won't get a soundbite out of me saying throw the cup. However, it's like there are there are more important things at play at the moment. So I'm, I'm not sure. Rotation-wise with Bueno, I think he's, he's probably right. Um, apart from that, I, I think, you know, Guedes needs to earn his place, not be given his place. Yeah, and sadly, the only times you do that is in the doldrum of domestic cup football. So I think he might have to do that against um, He's got to wait Forest six days, or um, yeah, yeah, Forest or Liverpool basically to earn his space as opposed to be given it. No, that that's fair. I mean, uh, to be fair, I I, I've, I I like Wang, and he's not disappointed me this season. And I can't see. I, I'd I'd be intrigued to see a front three of Troy or Ray Kuna and Wang. Hmm. Potentially, mm, yeah. I can definitely see Adama starting because he's he's shown a couple of sparks under Lopetegui in terms of being the player that we need him to be. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be an interesting game, and I would like to think that from the last two games, we're at least going to attack the game with the right mentality mm. um, and be able to do it across the whole game as well. Yeah. Whereas, you know, under large, I'd be I'd be apprehensive about whether we start the game correctly, and in the interim period, whether we get to sixty minutes and just break down um, mentally. So I think it's going to be an interesting game. Um, before we do score predictions, though, um, in terms of other fixtures happening um, over the 
game week match day. Have a look. You want to look at it? Um, a couple that might be of interest to us in our doldrums, which makes me feel quite sad, is uh, Southampton Forest play each other, mm. and also Leeds West Ham as well. So there's a couple of really big games in that bottom eight teams in the division. Um, as you're saying, we are still quite congested at the moment. Um, but I, I guess uh, stepping back from a neutral perspective, bar the maybe the Chelsea Man City game, are any games that uh, catch your eye, Sonberg, um, Jafo, Matt? And yeah, from, I mean, from, from Arsenal, my, Newcastle, but from, yeah, not, yeah. not looking around us. I think Arsenal, Newcastle is, is such a huge game for, for, for the Gunners moving forward. I mean, they uh, they're having a good season, as we all know, but it's games against people like Newcastle, you know, and and the people who are hanging around just outside the top six that are really going to be the acid test for them. And I think this will be the one. I think hopefully we get like the Czech Tiote four four moment again. That would be fantastic. Oh, that that yeah. would just be just football magic if we could see something like that happen again. I mean, I was having a little look earlier. Um, in terms of like football over the calendar year, and I think Arsenal over the, the I think it's technically 37 games in 2022. I believe they're only like two points behind Man City. So like their their form of the last six months of last season and first half of this season for Arsenal, you know you you can't not talk about them. Uh, being a title contender, um, so yeah, I think I think it's going to be a couple of, an interesting round of fixtures. To be fair, I can I can see a lot of them going either way. One I think that might be a drubbing is I do I'd like to think that Man United smash Bournemouth though. Mm. It, I think that um that the Leicester game is crucial for Leicester to win more than the fixture that suggests it will be last on match of the day suggests because yes. um this if they lose another game and team around them start to get points i think they are bang in trouble again get dragged um, into it yeah i really do i think like you know it's this point now and it's so bizarre to say this because there's still so much of the season left but you're starting to look at teams now that you would rather get out of trouble because it helps us with teams that are so close to us. So Leeds, West Ham, for example, you kind of almost think, okay, right, if, if one of them has to win, at least make it the team that's further up the table. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants Leeds to win, which is which is understandable. But, um, and the same way in like kind of Forest and Southampton, I don't know if we had to choose one of them to win, who would be the better one? Because I think in the same way that Stu so eloquently put, that Everton drawing keeps Lampard in the job and that will be a long-term benefit to us. <laughs> I don't know if like, if, you know, Southampton winning in the long run is a better result because it drags Forrest further and further down who are more likely to go down. I don't know. Um, I guess a draw, I suppose, is the, is, is the best result from our point of view um, in, in that situation. Um, it's just because it's two leagues now, it's that, it's that jump up from kind of 12th upwards and 13th downwards. There's just cracking game that has massive implications to the bottom end of the table, like every week. It was very exciting. Yeah. And my, my sort of thing is like, you, you are two, you are two wins away from kind of pulling yourself into mm. a, into a respectable position. If we, you know, if we manage to get six points, which four's probably more likely, even four points would probably pull us to um, six, 15th, 16th. You'd and all of so. a sudden we can't go, okay, yeah, it's still not looking good. We're still in the thick of that bottom half of the league. But you at least... I feel like if you're... Anywhere above that line, above eighteenth, you've got that little le- little bit less pressure on you, and mm-hmm. I, I, I don't, you know, even though you've got three points separating twentieth and six and sixteenth bar goal difference, that 
would just give you give us that little bit more breathing space. And I do I do think it's achievable. I, I really do. Um, but let's hear your score predictions for Villa then, Matthew. Uh, I do think we draw this. I think we draw one one. I'm relatively confident. I mean, I was relatively confident against Man United. I could, I, I'm sort of, I'm starting to feel that sort of buzz again. So, I, I mean, I'll go with a win. I, I actually, actually, I think we'll keep a clean sheet. I'll go two 0 See, I was going to go for a one niler. I don't mm. quite know how we're going to do it, but yeah, it'd be nice to beat the Villa <laughs> as, as much as anything else. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go one nil, but hey, it's good to see if still feeling a bit more confident about about it though. Um let's let's wrap up the show really quickly with a few questions from Twitter Corner. First off, we have the ever dashing uh Matt Guy. Hello. Um Hello. <laughs> Okay, um right. I I don't even know I'm not even gonna read the question. I'm I'm gonna allow you to oh, I'm gonna give you the floor, Matt, to air your Thank thoughts. You. Thank you, uh, Richard, because I, like many of us, I'm sure, very recently understood that the toaster dial is not levels of toastiness, but minutes. And I like my toast really well done to the point where I might put it in, take it out, turn the dial down and put it back in and give it another r- yeah. run through. So we're like talking a like a potential. Like a four plus two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we're talking a potential six to eight minute wait here now. Never felt like that before, before I knew this groundbreaking news. Um, and so actually, is this the, the most least time efficient to end result breakfast item around in terms of effort to end result when you've got to wait six to eight minutes for what is essentially warm, crispy bread? <laughs> I mean, you're not yours. wrong, are you? Compared to a bowl of cereal, which is done in thirty seconds, yeah, um, it, it's not. It's not a uh, effective believe, use of time. Yeah, and I it? believe it. It's not even just about the process of it being within the toaster. It's the after point as well. And Matt, me and you have discussed before the um, at what point the butter goes onto the toast is time critical it go massively and you've got to be on the ball with it so yes it's six minutes and you know what yeah you could make your cup of tea or you can you know prep your other stuff in that time period but you've got to have half your eye on the neck you know it, is it going to ding because i've got to mm. get i've got to get over there by which I make bad, I make bad kitchen multitasker as well. If I've got to toast, and there's something in the <laughs> oven, and I need to fry, <laughs> you're having good. a meltdown. You're done. I'm having a meltdown. You uh, know, see, be, but... you know, it'd be hilarious and would show the influence of the fan cast right now. If overnight we have a rebranding from toaster wolves to cereal wolves, <laughs> I'd absolutely love to see that. As I say, in terms of um, food slash breakfast item and about time efficiency, and this kind of relays into what we were just talking about, it's making scrambled eggs. Because mm. to do good scrambled eggs, you need to stir constantly. Yep, there's a lot you, of uh, manual labour going on. Yeah, here. there's no, there's no two ways about it. Now, I have it roughly timed for the amount of scrambled eggs I have. It is pretty much the same length as I have my toast. Because I have scrambled egg on toast. But again, looping back, Matt, the point of which you put the butter on is time critical. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be at the exact point that the scrambled egg is essentially done. And the last thing you want, the last thing I want is watery scrambled egg because I've had to manipulate the temperature whilst I'm trying to get the spread right. Yes. So. Although I really like it as a dish, it, it yeah, I, I I can only focus on doing that. I can't be doing, you know, yeah, it sounds really savage to say, I can't be focused on doing my kids' lunch. 
No, that, you know, I'm, I'm just concerned, to be not. honest, that, that you're going to turn into some kind of culinary Dr. Octopus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and have to I make mean, some kind of cyber suit, you know, in order I, to get another pair of hands. I, I, I need to. Um, yeah. He, he just needs to invite sadly, attention. Sadly, Rich doesn't give me the Dr. Octopus vibes. He gives me more Wallace and Gromit vibes. <laughs> 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 so, uh, <laughs> that's, sadly, um, more Rich's vibes, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, that's, every kitchen, that's pretty fair. Um, it's cracking. Yeah. Um, have you got any thoughts about um, toasters and how the efficiency of breakfast items? Do feel free to drop us a comment in the uh, in the uh, in the YouTube sections or on social media. Um, right, a couple more questions then, um, of which do take a slight turn, to be fair, um, because we're at that point anyway. So, um, King Wolf eighty four asks: Now that um, the dust of Christmas has settled, what was the best and worst present you got this year? Ooh. That's, that's going to be yeah, caught my cause in trouble. But got people watching. Well, should we just but, go for best present? Let's go for best present. Best. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll cover ourselves. Yeah, I think that's probably that's probably the wisest yeah. decision. Yeah. I mean, mine's mine's as as you probably know. You guys know. I don't know the people who know me very well, but I am a bit of a gaming nerd, and my obsession for the past few months has been Genshin Impact, <laughs> which is it says a lot about me as a person. But yeah, I have a, a new statue behind me for one of the characters from Genshin. I think that, that's kind of one of my favourites, the little guy in the green hat. That's uh, it's little things like that and bring me happiness. So very nice things like very that. Nice, Matt. How about you? Well, uh, not not that he needs my financial help, but I think I'm putting one of Dwayne the Rock Johnson's kids through school at the moment because <laughs> I just got a lot of like Rock Under Armour stuff for Christmas, which I love. Okay. And um, I got I got this huge duffel bag for the gym, which has more compartments than I know what to do with. And for someone that likes things really organised and neat, um, it was a, a pure delight. Very nice. I've now been panicking about what my best Christmas present was, and I have absolutely no idea. Actually, yes, I do. Um, my brother got me. Um, it's they're called beer biscuits. I was like, okay, hmm. but it's basically um, like the mixture to make the biscuits, and you have to add beer to it. Oh no! Nice. So he got me, um, there yeah, he got me a bottle of Banks as well, which I've still yet to um, adventure to doing, but I'm intrigued by it. Um, I think that's a solid present um, from him, so I'm I'm keen to do that one. Um, last question, um, I believe. Before... Oh no, we've got a couple of questions even better um yeah dean marston who i believe is watching live as well big shout out to anyone watching live um do you have any football based new year's resolutions Ooh, um i want to avoid especially when i'm drunk reverting to football cliche just because it sounds right in the you know the the passion of the game like I before the World Cup break, I had to go on Twitter for people who just shout press, press, <laughs> like not really un- like understanding why. But like there's, there's there's certain things that like you just shout out, don't you? Just because they sound right at the time. I'll try and avoid that at all at all times and not let um not let the moment take take away with me. Yeah, I feel like I've just been right. called out because I'm one of those people who just shout press quite. A- <laughs> 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 not get the line. <laughs> but no, no, I, I, I haven't really thought about it to be honest. It's not really something that I think about is in New Year's resolutions. I mean, if, if one, it would be to try and remain a little bit positive and, and not get sucked into any negativity over the club. Uh, <laughs> that's it's pretty pretty basic, but I think probably just something like that. Well, my, mine's kind of on those lines, but a slightly different message is I've decided to uh, yeah be more opinionated on Twitter. It is, <laughs> you know, I've, I've sort of just decided, yeah, you know what, I'm going to share my views. And I, I'm not one for a Twitter argument. I don't have the time or energy to be like, you know, be sit, sat on the sofa and my wife go, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just, just arguing with so-and-so about an opinion that he has. So I'm just going to start airing mine more forthright and we'll, we'll see how it goes. 
I, I'm looking forward to the battle between you and Dean Marsden. That'll, that'll be oh, the no, one it, Twitter, Twitter ages, that one. Oh, no. Dean, no, Dean's solid. Dean's a, Dean is a good stand-up man. Um, but I'm just going to try and find something now. But I'll, I'll, I'll try and find something I can pick out on him. Maybe his choice of um, a legal streaming platform. Um, <laughs> that's my last Twitter exchange with him. Um, which you know I what? Would... You know, can I can I interject here with something, uh, Rich? I was with Dean the other day, and um, I introduced him to one of my mates, and I said, "It's Twitter famous Dean Master," <laughs> and he he looks mortified. <laughs> he didn't. So I think if you're going to go down that line, that's the line to go with. If you need, you know, perfect, Ben. Perfect. I'll start making. Um, I'll, I'll open up like a little notes on my phone, just titled Dean Vendetta, Dean v- <laughs> Vendetta. The... I feel like I'm in community now. Um, right, last question, Ben. Now I've gone silly on us all. Um, Amar's Music Show asks if we started the season with Lopetegui, but with the same squad as we did, where do you think Wolves would finish in the league slash, I guess, where this point now? Hmm. I love fantastical questions like this because I can just, just give them any answer and it'd just be bullshit and it just, yeah. <laughs> it'd just be, oh. it can't be, can't be proven right or wrong but I, yeah. I certainly think we'd be in a better position. I, I think we'd probably be sort of where Villa are now, probably between 10th yeah. and 12th. I still, yeah. I don't think we've got the, the right squad from between then and now to, to really push to where we should be as a, as a club and where we want to be in the top half. I don't think we probably could do that. But fantastic world, we probably would be. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it would be more comfortable, but at the end of the day, it wouldn't be the revolution that we probably need and we would still need a couple of windows to really start to push towards the, the promised land of you know European qualification, which I think has all of a sudden been the benchmark. The Europa Conference League has sort of become the benchmark of success because of what, we've achieved over uh, you know in five years so um i think we'd be comfortable but not to those heights yeah i i agree i think we'd be in villa territory because i think we'd arguably fitter be playing smarter football better defensively but would we be able to address the amount of goals we have probably not to as much as degree um so that wraps it up for today's show we'll be back after villa game to talk about the result and also uh, preview the Liverpool game as well. Big thanks to our sponsors Pixel Yeti Media and 19 Min of course and big shout out to everyone who's watched live and also watched the show over the last I was going to say over the last 12 months and continuing to do so we could, I can't put into words how much we value the support of anyone who listens, watches, engages with us Um, it it means the absolute world um, to us because at the end of the day we are just you know a group of a group of mates who like talking about wolves and you know it it, getting shared with other people then is even better so we'll be hoping to bring you even more um, football chat and nonsense uh, on a continual regular basis but until next time it's goodbye from Jaffo goodbye it's goodbye from Matt take care of yourselves everybody And it's goodbye from me. Happy New Year.